Welcome to Fruit Snacks, a weekday podcast that covers big ideas about the Christian worldview in a bite-sized format. Hey everyone, in this week we are going to be turning our attention back to a couple points of doctrine, specifically looking at more attributes of God. Now these attributes this week are all in a way interconnected and they are leading us toward a bigger discussion about the doctrine of the cross and exactly how Jesus' death on the cross works, how it can possibly pay for our sins or everyone's sins. And so this week, as a way of building up to that, we're going to lay some foundation by looking at several attributes of God, starting today with holiness and understanding from a biblical perspective what exactly is holiness. Now, from our modern perspective and the way that we tend to use this word, we associate God being holy with God's moral perfection. That is to say that God is perfect and he never does anything that would be considered wrong or bad or evil or sinful. God isn't even capable of doing those kinds of things. And so God is always good and only good and nothing that God does is in any way less than perfectly righteous. And that is certainly a sense in which the original audience of Scripture would have understood God's holiness. But what's interesting is while this idea of moral perfection has sort of taken the driver's seat in our context, it was really more of a backseat understanding in the ancient context. Because the way that holiness gets used in the Bible is very different from how we tend to think of it. Literally, something being holy, and this is true in both the Hebrew and in the Greek usage, means to be set apart. And we see examples of this, of all kinds of things being called holy in the Bible that we wouldn't necessarily associate with holiness today. For instance, in Genesis 2-3, the seventh day of creation is called holy. And in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, the Sabbath day, is called holy. These are days that are different. They're set apart. So days can be holy. In Exodus 3, 5, we see that places can be holy. This is the burning bush where the angel of the Lord tells Moses that the ground upon which he is standing is holy. It is set apart. It is different. It's not normal. Clothes can also be holy. In Exodus 28, 2, we see an example, just one of many examples about the priestly garments, meaning that these garments are special. These are not everyday clothes. These are, these are garments that are only to be worn in certain instances and for certain things. They are set apart and they are considered unique for a specific purpose. We also see that people are holy. In Leviticus 11, 44 through 45, we see that Aaron and the priests and those who are set apart for serving God are considered holy. doesn't mean that they are morally perfect or that they're any more righteous than anyone else, but that they have a sacred purpose and calling. And in fact, in a bunch of passages like Job 15, 15, Psalm 89.5 and Psalm 89.7, Daniel 4.17, and in Zechariah 14.5, there is a group of spiritual beings in the Old Testament called God's holy ones, his counsel, who are in heaven serving him. And again, it doesn't mean that they are morally perfect like God is, but it rather means that they are set apart for the express purpose of serving him and of being in his presence. Lastly, in the Old Testament, we see that names can also be holy, specifically God's name. In Psalm 97, 12, the name of the Lord is holy. It is unique, it is distinct, and it is set apart from all other names. 
So really, as a summary of the Old Testament, when we think about holiness, really we are talking about God and those things or people who are associated with God. Now in the New Testament, the usage of holy becomes far more narrow. We really only see it, broadly speaking, used in two ways. Either speaking of the Holy Spirit, so God's Spirit as distinct and set apart from any other spirit, and of Christians. Now, often we hear this term saints get thrown around in our translations, and I think that that is really an unfortunate translation because it causes us to miss the Old Testament connection. Literally, in the New Testament, we're not called saints. We're called holy ones. The same phrase that's used in those verses I just mentioned about God's counsel. And the theology of the New Testament is that in some way, shape, and form, we both have and will in the future be grafted into and even replace some of those who are in God's counsel in the Old Testament. So holy really means sacred, set apart, special, or even belonging to deity and to God. And that includes Christians, you, me, anyone who belongs to God means that we are set apart. We are part of God's sacred space and purpose. And that means that there are certain things to consider or think about when it comes to how we uh, behave how we act, how we treat others, because not just anything could enter holy or sacred space. Something had to be fit or made fit in order to be part of sacred space. And so, as believers who have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, we have been made fit for sacred space. So the question really just becomes, are we acting in accordance with our fitness. 